already know most of y'all, Buddy Whitlock. And we're going to take this tour around town, and we'll probably be gone an hour or so. We're just going to go up about to the Methodist Church and come back down. On this. So we're not going far. We start out here kind of what I think of as the center of downtown Tuscumbia. And, you know, Tuscumbia is a unique town. A lot of people wonder why did Tuscumbia develop where it developed? What was the reason? Well, location. It starts out with Spring Creek down here. And if you haven't been down there, I hope you go down there at some point, especially this weekend. The springs produce about 35 million gallons of water a day. Incredible amount of water bubbles up in those springs. So that was where people traveling through would camp out. I mean, a great supply of water, and plus it's protected from the elements down the, the hole kind of. So that was a great place to, to camp. And so that is, is kind of why the town settlers first arrived here. And then, of course, we're gonna talk a little bit about the railroad. The railroad was developed mainly to get goods back and forth to the river. That's all the railroad was here for. And it was the first railroad in this part of the country which is very unique. Um, but eventually that, that paid big dividends because they used this railroad to connect to Decatur and Cortland. And at that time you couldn't go up and down the river because the, the shoals um, kept boat traffic. You could come up as far as Tuscumbia and you could come down the river about as far as Decatur. So they expanded the railroad and they were able to bring goods and people <laughs> around the shoals that were going out west. And so, all of a sudden, Tuscumbia just began to grow. They eventually will talk about a super highway that came through here. The Jackson, uh, Andrew Jackson built the military road that also came through Florence and the crossover to, uh, over here through Tuscumbia. But all those things intersect with Tuscumbia. And that's why Tuscumbia took off so many years ago because basically of its location. I mentioned a little bit about the, um, the, the depot down there. The depot is actually from 1880. 1880. We're not going to walk down there. It is open today, so I encourage you to go in. I think they have a model railroad display. So please go through there and, 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 and see the, the railroad. Um, it's open for special events. The palace that we're standing in front of, of course, this was a, the railroad hotel. In the original days, the railroad came right through town. Most people don't realize that. The now it goes around through Sheffield. So in the early days, when, um, they originally just ran through the river. And when they started expanding, course, they went to Decatur, Portland, but they also went to Newsley to Memphis. And so this became part of the Memphis Charleston Railroad, which in that, before the Civil War, was the largest railroad in the world. And so it came right through town. That's why the street's so wide here. <laughs> and that made this kind of the center of town. Um, across the street, there's seven adjoining buildings. You see those right there in a row? That is probably the, the, the biggest collection of antebellum architecture, commercial architecture, in the state of Alabama today. Those buildings pretty much look like they did in the 1830s. That's where you would have had your, your commerce type businesses like they are today. And uh, of course across the street here you had the railroad hotel and now on the far corner, it's not there anymore, but you had uh, another large three-story hotel. It was very grand and that was kind of the, where all the civic activity would take place in town. Also, there's a, we had all the vices that you might find those days. There was a gambling hall rumored to be underneath that particular hotel. And they say it's still there today. It's in the parking lot. But there's a parking lot that, that covers up the gambling hall. And also there's stories of a tunnel. You could actually come in one of these buildings and look like you were shopping and go to the basement and take the tunnel back to the gambling hall just to kind of protect your reputation. <laughs> Which was important even in those days. But so this was kind of the center of town. But this all happened in the 1830s. Our history goes back a lot further than that. Think of probably around 1780 is when we really know about this area through um, various writings. The French were coming through here. This was all wilderness in the 1780s. The French were coming through here and trading with the Indians. Now when I say Indians at that time, this was mainly Chickasaw land. There were no major Indian villages here. They used this area for hunting. So there was, a, of course, a, a, probably a camp down there by the springs where they would camp when they were in the area, but um, this was Chickasaw land. So the, the, the French came through, they established that trading post about two miles from here at the mouth of Spring Creek, where Spring Creek flows into the Tennessee River. 
they operated that trading post for a while, and then eventually it fell out of favor for whatever reasons, and the French abandoned it. But as soon as the French abandoned the trading post, the Indians took it over. And they used it to launch raiding parties on Nashville, Tennessee. So that's how we know a lot about the area because eventually the Nashville militia got tired of these Indian raiding parties coming out of here and attacking the settlements around Nashville. So they came down and destroyed the trading post. And that's all documented. And that was in the late 1780s. So that's when we know there was activity here. And then about 1815 to 1817, Michael Dixon arrives. And we consider Michael Dixon to be the first settler of Tuscany. He's the, the, our founding father, we say. He came here on his keelboat, this legend has it, up to, came down the Tennessee River, found the mouth of Spring Creek, and came all the way up Spring Creek, and met the Indians down here in the park at their hunting camp, and smoked the peace pipe with them. He liked the area, and if it wasn't for these buildings, you'd get a good view. He, he struck a deal with the Indians. Or at least he thought he struck a deal with the Indians. He bought all the land from the foothills of the mountains, which are the Crawford Heights Mountains, the Wiener Mountain that you can see on the other side of Spring Park, all the way to the river, which is a lot of land. And I think he gave, like, it's reported two pole axes and five silver dollars and something else. And he he got all this land he bought. Five gold pieces, okay. Well, this turns out that the, the Indian nation had actually been in negotiations with the U.S. government. And they had already sold the land to the government. So he ended up not getting anything with his purchase. But the, the, the government was kind and let him choose a couple of lots when they had the land sale. So, but anyway, 1815 is when, or 1817, there's debate over that, when Michael Dixon arrived. And he settled here, and within about a year or so, there were over a thousand people. And what was happening was our original country was the 13 colonies along the eastern seaboard very crowded by the late 70s or the early 1800s. The land was starting to get worn out from all the farming, and so people were wanting to go west. You've heard the saying, go west, find your fortune. Well, in the early days, this was the Wild West. And we think of the Wild West as being California and Nevada and Arkansas, not Arkansas, but um, Arizona and all those places. And that is the Wild West, but in the early, early days, this was the Wild West. And so what was happening is the, the families were sending off some of their members this direction. And this is one of the first places you'd come. You'd go to Knoxville or to Huntsville and you'd come right through areas like Tuscumbia. Each state had areas like this. And um, it's, it's interesting, a lot of our structures date to the early, early days. I mean, we'll see some buildings that were built, some houses that were built in the 1830s, 1820s, and they're brick. And you see these buildings that are brick. And, how could people build such structures on the frontier in those early days? Well, the settlers or the travelers that were coming here to put down roots were not necessarily your, your, your poor people. They had lots of money. They had slaves. And they had livestock. They had everything they needed to set up a house. And so as they were traveling here, they would sit down and they had the, the craftsmanship, they had the money, and they could build a nice structure from day one. So that's kind of remarkable because when we think about out west, in the cowboy movies that I used to watch, the people were always in like little log cabins and various things. When, and they, I'm sure at, at times they were doing that here, but it didn't take long for the money to arrive and they were able to build some really nice structures because these families had, had deep roots along the, the eastern coast of the United States. So, we've talked about this hotel. There was another hotel, like I said, down the corner. Across the street was a hotel. There was a number of hotels. It's amazing how much activity was going on in Tuscumbia in the, between 1830 and 1860. <clears throat> you know, I mentioned the railroad that we'll talk a little bit more about later. The railroad was major. Along with the railroad came your mail route. Your telegraph came along with that too. So that's why all that ended up on this side of the river and not on the Florence side of the river. Um, and you know, Florence is just as old as Tuscumbia, but we had to kickstart a couple of these things and it made Tuscumbia the, the center of all the activity prior to the Civil War. Now what happened after the Civil War, our economy on this side of the river was destroyed. It was in Florence as well, but they had more industry. They were more diversified. And so they bounced back a little quicker after the Civil War and they hadn't slowed down since. They were just booming over on that side of the river. It took us a while to get our feet back on this side of the river. Um, but we, we, we did survive.
one building, and I hope this is the Keller Festival, so I'll point out a couple of things about the Keller family. This building on the corner here that says Audie Mescal, that was where Captain Keller, which was Helen's father, had a newspaper. And there's a story about and when Helen was a little girl, she loved, of course, she was already blind and deaf at this point, she loved to come to work with her dad. And so he would bring her every morning to the office, and she would make her rounds with him. They'd go to the post office and get the mail and do various things. And then when it was ready for him really to sit down and get serious about work, he would sit Helen on her pony, point the pony back toward Abby Green, and the pony would take off by itself with Helen on the back. I mean, we couldn't do that today. You'd be put under the jail. But in those days, it was okay. Um, the pony was well trained. And of the interesting fact, the Desher Female Institute, which we'll talk about a little bit later, was a girls' school, and it was located a couple blocks up the street. And those were all Helen's playmates. Of course, Helen could not go to school at that point, but they were in school. And if it happened to be recess, when Helen was coming by, they would stop the pony, take Helen off, and let her play with them at recess. And then when it came time for them to go back inside the building for school to continue, they'd put Helen back on the pony. The pony would continue on to Ivy Green, which is just a few blocks on down the road. So, but that's a different world, different, different time. All right, so what we're gonna do, let's walk on across the street and we're gonna go all the way. I wanna, we're gonna end up at the white building on the corner. So if y'all wanna cross to here and walk up that way. And that's why the third story is now gone. But originally we had a saloon on the first floor and then the upstairs floors would be uh, where your rooms that you could rent out. Also, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the founding of Calvert County and the uh, original uh, offices were located in this building when they established Calvert County many years ago. I'll, I'll point out across the street, the Church of Christ Annex. That's obviously a newer building, but in the 1830s, that's where Isaac Young had a carriage factory. Again, that was a three-story building in the 1830s. It was on that site. And Isaac Young made the Cadillac version of the carriage in those days. If you had a, one of his carriages in the south, you were very well off. So this was a, an important business for the city of Tuscany. His house is a couple of streets over that we can see that on another tour. Um, and then, then after Isaac Young's business, of course, went away, um, the first location for the Helen Keller Public Library was in that building as well before they tore it down. So, this house that I want to point out, this is um, Dr. Alexander's house. It stayed in the family until probably the 1990s. The house was built around 1824 to 1828. There's some debate on the time the house was built. Its brickwork is Flemish bond, which again, in the brick laying world, that's a very expensive way or pattern to lay brick. It's very sturdy. So if you can do the Flemish bond, which a lot of our structures that are brick do have that type of brickwork but it took a special craftsman to do that type of bricklaying. This house is what you would call a federal townhouse. You can tell it's built flush with the sidewalk, so it, that's why it's a townhouse. The dining room is actually located in what we would call the basement. And if you've had a chance to go in this house, if you go down to the basement, the floor is beautiful. It's brick floor that's got a pattern in it. And so, that's where most of the dining rooms were located in those early days in some of these houses, which is hard for us to believe. Uh, but again, the, dining, or the basement is not like what we think of a basement. It's not dark and damp and, <laughs> and dingy. So, there are actually some windows that let in light to the basement. Um, an interesting fact about this, there's a tunnel that leads from the kitchen, which is this building behind the house, to the dining room. And that was to allow the cooks uh, to get the food into the house in the bad weather without having to go outside. They, I think if you go in the house today, down in the dining room area, they've got the doors open to the tunnel. It's closed in, so you can't actually use the tunnel, but you can see where it was located. They've got nice doors. It's really unusual that you have the dependencies still with this house. The wooden structure back there would have been the, the kitchen, which is always, you know, um, next to the house, it was never located in the house because of fire. You got the kitchen, you have cook's quarters, and then you have a sewing room or a room, and they could actually use for a summertime dining room if it was cooler, um, sometimes up outside, kind of like that. So 
that's pretty unusual that you still got that structure there. But again, this house stayed in the same family for all those generations. Um, Dr. Abernathy was a um, surgeon for the Confederate uh, Army. After the Civil War, he came back and he added this wing to the house, and that's where he practiced his medicine. But that's, uh, today this is privately owned. It's gone through hands. It was um, restored by the people that own the title company next door, and then the Baptist Church bought it and owned it for a while, and now it's back into private hands. We're just always worried every time it goes up for sale because who's going to end up with it? It's such a, a piece of architectural history as well as Tuscany history. Um, that's a federal style townhouse. While we're standing here, I'll point across the, to the courthouse. Now, you can't see the courthouse real good because of the trees, but we got a beautiful courthouse. That building dates back to around 1908. The original courthouse burned down um, in the late 1800s due to fire. But let's go back a little further. You realize this was all part of Franklin County. When, when uh, Alabama was established, uh, we were part of Franklin County. And it was not until after the Civil War 18 and maybe 1867 that they carved out Culverton and there was a power struggle the whole time because there was a lot of in those years there was a lot of wealth and a lot of influence and businesses up in this part of Franklin County of course the town seat was in Russellville and so there was always this battle but finally they got enough support in Montgomery after the war to carve out Culbert County and so they they carved it out to what you see today soon after they carved it out they rescinded the order and did away with Carver County. And so then Carver County went back to being part of Franklin County. And then a couple of years later, they were able to get the political clout again to create Carver County and it stuck. And of course, if you get into politics, you know, Montgomery, we always think of South Alabama. And that's one of the reasons that they did not want, South Alabama people didn't want another county created because it gave us another vote in matters at the state house. So there was a lot going on behind the scenes to keep another county from being created, but eventually they went out and they were able to create Calvert County. Of course, Calvert County is named after the Indians, um, the Chickasaw Indian Chief, and uh, that's a whole other another tour there that we can talk about the, the Calvert family. But anyway, the original courthouse was a Victorian structure, and it burned um, in the late 1800s, and the walls and the windows are, the, are still there. That's why you see what you do. When they decided to rebuild the courthouse, they put the columns and the bell tower above it or the cupola on top of it. So they used the same walls and windows, they just changed the format. Does anybody know why it's painted white? It's painted white to hide the, the scorch marks from the original fire. The same thing they did with the White House in Washington, D.C. They painted it white. Um, to, to, to make it look nice, and of course you couldn't get the scorch marks and fire out of the brick. So that's why we have a white courthouse. The front of the courthouse actually faces towards Spring Park. Most people think this is the front, or the front is on Water Street. But now the actual front, the original front, is this uh, porch on the south side of the building. There have been two large additions made to the courthouse. The wing that goes north was added in the 1940s, and then the wing that goes out toward Water Street, where most activity or most people go in today, um, that was added in the 1970s. And they did a really good job of adding this. I mentioned a little bit about how we, we developed in the early 1800s with Michael Dixon arriving. One of the unique, unique things about Tuscumbia is this was all owned by the federal government. I talked about the Chickasaw Indians had struck a deal and they sold the land to the um, U.S. government. In Florence, you had a group of private investors come in and buy up the land. That was the Cypress Land Company. Over here, for whatever reason, the government bought the land up. So you had two different business models competing in the early days. Now, the U.S. government, they bought the land, so they needed to survey it and lay out a town, they realized. And so they hired and, um, General Coffee from Florence to come over. He was a surveyor. He was a friend of Andrew Jackson. If you remember Coffee Hospital, that was all in his family. Um, General Coffey came over and laid out Tuscumbia. It's about a mile and a half one direction and a mile the other direction. And we're bordered by what we call the Commons, which is very uncommon. And there's only one other town in the country or city that I know of that has a Commons, and that's Boston Commons. Why we have a Commons, nobody really knows, but when General Jackson, or General Coffey laid us out, 
you put a commons, which is like a belt, going all the way around the town. And, you know, we, we, it's not like it used to be, especially if you're new to the area, but there used to be a tremendous rivalry between the two sides of the river. Yeah, there still is, but it doesn't, it doesn't seem as obvious to me as it used to. Um, but even back in those days, and it goes back to when Tuscumbia was founded, we kind of snubbed our nose at Florence. I mentioned we had the mail route come through here, we had the train on this side of the river. Florence didn't get any of that. And so you had all the people over here. But one of the things that Florence did, I mean, that Tuscumbia did was mail delivery. They would only send the mail over to Florence once a week. It came to Tuscumbia every day. And they would make, they couldn't find the time. They said, we just can't get over to Florence but once a week. So Florence had to live with it. Um, also, banking. There was no bank. Even though Tuscumbia was a bustling town in those early days, there was no bank here. There was a bank in Decatur, and there was a bank in Florence. But if you were a true Tuscumbian, you did not want to give any business to people in Florence. So you could ride the train to Decatur in the morning and, and catch another train coming back from Decatur just coming in the afternoon you can do your banking in Decatur. So your true Tuscumbians banked in Decatur and uh, they only let the mail go over to, to, to Florence <laughs> once a week. So that's where the rivalry kind of started and it's been it's been fierce over the years. Um, we could talk about the Confederate monument out there. There was a, a battle over those between the two towns. Um, just a lot of rivalries. Of course, athletics, sports athletics, uh, uh, high school sports have been big. <laughs> Com competitions over the years. It, it just goes on and on and on. Um, but anyway, that's, that's, that's some of the things that we did on this side of the river to, to encourage the rivalry, I guess. Let's walk on down to the next board of new technology. So they got a mechanical engineer from Pennsylvania to come down to put it all together. His name was David Deschler. All right. The Deschler family was very prominent. Um, and so, and obviously they had a lot of money. They hired him to come in and be an investor part of the original railroad group. David Desher built his house on this lot across the street. He built a quite large house. We've got some pictures of it. So that tells us that he had money when he arrived here. Um, he had a large family. He had, uh, of course, a wife and three children. Now, the, the railroad was a big hit, but when you listen about David Desher's life history, it was kind of sad. His daughter, he had one daughter, and she died as a child of an illness. He had two sons, both went off to uh, West Point Military Academy before the war. Now this is all before the war. And they were, what we know, excellent students. But one son drowned while at West Point in a swimming accident. The other son, James Dester, graduated and went on um, into the Army. And then he went into the Confederate Army when the Civil War broke out. And he was a Brigadier General. He had risen to that rank. But he was actually killed at the Battle of Chickamauga. So, all of a sudden, David has no family left. Um, the the wind, or the, the Dester uh, burial sites are in the Tuscumbia Oakwood Cemetery. And when the um, oldest son died at Chickamauga, David Dester went to the battlefield, dug up his body where they had buried him, and brought him back here and, and buried him in Tuscumbia Oakwood Cemetery. So, uh, the general is here in the cemetery. But then, after um, when David Dester finally passed away, it was a, a, a kind of a, a quirky thing in his will. He did not want any of his money or his, anybody in his family that was a union sympathizer during the war to inherit any of his fortune. And so they had to look high and low and they found one gentleman that lived in Pennsylvania that evidently they could prove that he was not a union sympathizer during the Civil War. So he inherited what David Desher did not leave to the city of Tuscany. And uh, of course, what Tuscumbia did, they got the land here. He, he left them this spot, and he wanted the female institute built. So we originally, the forerunner to the Tuscumbia school system was the Desher Female Academy. The building was built on the back corner of this lot, and it was built around 1874. And it was a school for girls, a very nice school for girls. Right after they built the school, a tornado of 1874 came through town and, just, and did a lot of damage. To the school and pretty much destroyed the Destler home so they did not rebuild the Destler home at that time. They were able to rebuild the female academy. So we had the female academy and then there was this heir in uh, Pennsylvania that had all the money. And so they, the story is anytime they needed work to be done at the school they had to contact 
the man in Pennsylvania, you had to get him to release some funds, do whatever work needed to be done. So it was, I mean, we were very fortunate to have all that, but it was it was a lot of work to, to deal with somebody so far away. Eventually, that female academy was absorbed by the Tuscumbia school system. And yeah, they tore it down, and on this site was where the um, Destro High School was built. And of course, Destro High School is named for the Destro family. Um, the original Destro High School was built here, and then in the, in the late 1950s or early 60s, they moved to the present location a couple of streets over. They bought the Winston Farm and the Winston home. That's why you have the Winston home and not the Destro home that sits in the middle of the Destro campus today. That was the Winston farm. But the city bought that enough acreage from that farm to move the school to that location. But that's our story about the, the Destro family. First, of course, you can kind of get a glimpse of the Destro high school campus up the street. You see the dome where they play basketball. But if you look at the end of this block, you'll see a, the back of a log cabin. That's called the Stoddard log cabin. The significance to that is, is this is an old log cabin. It was actually built in western Calvert County, and it was probably built around the time Tuscumbia was settled, in the early, early 1800s. It was originally a dog trot cabin, which means there were the two rooms with the open section in the middle. They moved this cabin off somebody's land and brought it to Tuscumbia in the 1970s. I remember when they moved it up here, and it was for a restaurant they called Viney's. Viney was the family cook for the Keller family. So somebody had the idea of to open up a restaurant with three, you know, uh, just homegrown or home, home style cooking, and they called it Viney's. And it was a restaurant for a number of years, and it's been a number of things. It's been an attorney's office, it's been a gift shop. And I think for now it's for sale if somebody would like it, but it's a, a very old cabin, a very unique cabin. The next building I want to point out is the Episcopal Church. The Episcopal Church dates to the 1852 era. The architecture is called Carpenter Gothic. Now, the Gothic, you look at the windows, you can see the Gothic. Of course, Carpenter style. Um, originally, the bell tower was about twice as big as it is now, or as tall as it is now. During the tornado of 1874, it chopped off the top half of that, that bell tower. And due to financial reasons, they didn't rebuild it to that original height. So that's what you see now. The um, congregation, they do not, this is not an active church anymore. The last services were held in the 1950s. Uh, due to the size, they combined with the, the, the Episcopal Church in Sheffield. During the Civil War, the Union soldiers would um, stable their horses inside the church. I guess kind of like a barn. They camped around the outside of the church. They, they stable their horses inside the church, and because of that kind of activity, a lot of the church records are gone, unfortunately. Um, Helen Keller's uncle was one of the founding members of this church, uh, Dr. Abernathy. And uh, the concrete sides, or the uh, pillars on the sides, are from the tornado of 1874, they kind of hold the church up. Um, if you were to go inside the church, and it's open two or three times a year now, if you go in there, it's going to look like it did in the 1850s. It's very original. They have the, the old pa uh, Packard pump organ. There's no heating or cooling, I don't think, in there. <laughs> um, it's, people use it for special events. They have weddings there sometimes. Um, they have an All Saints service in November there, right around the time of Halloween or, or Thanksgiving. I can't remember exactly when it is. It's right after Halloween or right before Thanksgiving. But it's, it's open every year for that. Um, but other, it's just used for special occasions. There's some beautiful stained glass windows in there, and some of the windows memorialize some of the people that were their members that died during that tornado of 1874. Mm -hmm. So next time it's open, it'll be in the Calvert County Reporter. I encourage you to, to stick your head in there. Um, you just wouldn't want to stay a long time. It's not very comfortable. So. This road that we're on, this street, looks like a regular old street. This was the super highway in 1815. Andrew Jackson had just, uh, it was actually 1816 or so. Andrew Jackson had, had been victorious down at the Battle of New Orleans that everybody knows about. Well, one of the things they realized when we had to go down to New Orleans and fight the British was there was no easy way to move the U.S. Army through the country in those days. All there were were these little Indian trails. Kind of hard to move a big old army. And so they came through here, and there's stories about the, the military coming through here on the way to the Battle of New Orleans. Well, after all that had settled down, it was over, 
Andrew Jackson went to Congress and petitioned them for money to build a U.S. highway, I guess you could call it, a major highway for the purpose of moving the military. As our country was growing into the Wild West, we needed to be able to get the military pretty quick to places because of Indian uprisings or maybe the French or the, or the English were coming back, who knows. But they, they, Congress appropriated some money to build the road from the Hermitage, which is Andrew Jackson's home place right outside of Nashville, down to Columbus, Mississippi. Um, so that's why in Florence, the road is called Hermitage Drive. On this side, we just called it the Military Road. And now it has changed names and it's Dixon Street, named after the Dixon family that, that founded Tuscumbia. But in the early days, if you were going out west and you were not traveling by boat, so you were probably in a, uh, um, uh, either on a horse or in a, a covered wagon, you would try to find the easiest route and you would take this big old road. Great for Florence, great for Tuscumbia and all the towns that were located along this nice road. So that is why you see your churches located on this road. You've got the Episcopal Church, we're about to see the Baptist Church, there's the Church of Christ, the Presbyterian Church is a block over. The Methodist Church was down at the end of this road. Now today, here's the Methodist Church, but in the early days, it was on down by the, where the police station is. So this was what we would call Main Street in the original days of Tuscumbia. As the town grew, they moved everything over a, a block. So, But this was the military road, and, and we're, again, we owe our growth, fortunately, to this coming right through Tuscumbia. It was built in the 1880s. Um, they tore down the original structure and, and built this. And this is a New England style architecture. The windows are from Czechoslovakia and they date to like 1903 or 1904. But the original church is no longer here. The first Presbyterian church is located on the next street. We won't go all the way over there because um, we're not going inside. That building was constructed. 1828. <coughs> it is called um, Georgian Gothic architecture. That was uh, Carpenter Gothic architecture. This is Georgian Gothic ar architecture. It is made uh, of brick. The walls are about a foot, a little over a foot thick. It looks like a small church. It's not really that small once you get inside. It seats about 300 people. The church pretty much looks like it did when it was constructed in 1828. They have not made any changes other than it does have heating and cooling and carpet. The benches have been upgraded once, I think in 1904, and so they have cushions on them. But um, so it's very authentic inside, but it is also comfortable, unlike the Episcopal Church. The Keller family worship there. They still have descendants and worship there today. Um, the church has been added on to a couple of times. You can't see it, but behind there, there are there's a three-story addition. Uh, and, um, and there's a, a little meeting room also back there. So they've done a good job of hiding any addition. The bell tower is about 65 feet off the ground. There are two bells in the bell tower. One is the regular bell. The regular bell weighs a little over a thousand pounds and they don't ring it anymore because um, in, the, in the last 10 years or so, they decided it was about to make the building fall down. Every time you rang it, the whole structure would shake. So the large bell is not rung. There's an electronic bell that rings every hour. There's also some music, some bells that play that are all electronical. You wouldn't know it. You would think they were the real bells, but they're, it's an electronical version. Um, the, the current big bell was given by a young man that grew up in Tuscumbia. He was had a crush on a girl that attended the Presbyterian Church. He did not attend there, um, but his, his girlfriend, Miss Thornton, did. They never got married. And he went off, I think it's Jeff Wilson was his name. He went off to New York and made his fortune. And he, the original bell had to be taken down from the church because it developed a crack. And so when they took down the original bell, and this is in the 1890s, he stepped forward and gave the money for the new bell and had his girlfriend's name engraved on it. So when you go up into the bell tower, you'll see First Presbyterian Church and the date on one side of the bell. And then you'll see Miss Laura Thornton's name on the other side of the bell. They never married, they were just good friends. Um, she did get to do the ceremonial ringing of the bell the first time. The original bell was a gift from a church up in Philadelphia um, when the church was built in 1828. They, they, they took it down, like I said, because the crack, which is kind of ironic, the Liberty Bell had a crack too, so I don't know if there's something with the Philadelphia bell makers, but uh, they melted the original bell down. It was solid silver, and I think they made 56 or 58 silver dollars out of the original bell. 
the newer bell, like I said, was put in 1890, it's still there. That's the large bell. There's a death bell as well. So there's two bells up there. The death bell was only rung when somebody passed away. There's a member of the congregation. They don't ring that anymore, either, but it's still up in the, the sanctuary or in the bell tower. One of the unique facts or uh, facts about this church, this is probably the oldest Presbyterian church in the state of Alabama that has had a service every single Sunday morning since it was built. Now there are a couple of churches that are older, Presbyterian churches now, Presbyterian churches that are older. There's one in Selma, and there's one in um, Huntsville, and there's one in Florence. They all had to close their doors during the Civil War. Not uncommon for the minister to be arrested when the Union troops came to town. They would arrest anybody that might help create an uprising. So they would typically arrest some of the ministers, and um, that's what happened in Florence. The, one Sunday, the Florence minister made the mistake of praying for the Confederacy while the Union soldiers were in the congregation. They stopped the service. They arrested the minister. They, they marched him over here and put him on a train to Illinois to a prison camp. Now, the Union soldiers worshiped many times during the Civil War in that church as well, but the pastor never made the mistake of praying for the Confederacy while they were in there. Uh, Does the courthouse bell ring? The courthouse bell, it did ring. I hadn't paid attention lately. It, it should. You know, it hadn't been a problem. I don't know. It just does a regular bell. This one plays in song. Right. But you can hear it all over. Every hear hour? Yeah, every hour it oh. plays. You, just, you don't realize. You have to stop and think about it. Yeah, well, it doesn't do it at night. That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> if it's a song, it's coming. It's a right. two-story white frame house. It looks very traditional. But the interesting thing about this particular house, it was built around the early 1820s in Cherokee, Alabama. At some point, the family decided they wanted to move to Tuscany. They brought their house with them. They had an oxen drag it from Cherokee to the river. They floated it up the river on a barge. And then once they got to Tuscany Landing, they unloaded the house on the poles, basically, and they rolled it with oxen pulling it to this location. And it was probably this location probably in the 1830s. So it's been, they were doing things like that a long time ago. Mm. This is the Julian house. It's still in the same family. If you know Nina and Parker, she lives right next door. This is her family home. They use this house for special events um, from time to time, so it is open. It's not lived in every day. But what's unique, another unique thing about it, if you can see it from the side, and again, because of the leaves, we can't see it, it's called the American Eye House, which was really popular in the 1800s. It looks like the capital letter I, if you stand on the side, it's very narrow. It's only one room deep. Then you got your roof on the top and you got your basement or your foundation and it made the capital letter I if you're standing on the side looking at it. So that's why they call it the American Eye House. Now this is a smaller version. There's larger versions of it. And if you ride around any part of this part of the country, you'll see houses like that. From that time period, they were American, that's just a popular style, American Eye House. And then as the family had more money and resources, they would add on to the house. And so then you would see a wing go out to the back and and maybe the house would double in size, but they would start out as just a simple high house. Another interesting story about this house is upstairs in the front bedroom on the south end, there is a secret room. And all houses in the south during that time, during the 1800s, had, have a story. They either have ghosts or they have secret rooms. <laughs> this one has a secret room. Um, they use this room as behind a, you move a chest of drawers and there's a little door. We would call it an attic today probably, but it's hidden as long as that chest is there. And they would use that space to hide the valuables when the Union soldiers were in town. Now, you know, we had lots of, we didn't have any major battles here. Shiloh was the closest battle, but the Union forces did come through here periodically and occupied this country. So, their value was in that room and it's still there today and if you go on a tour of the house they'll move the chest and just show you that space. <laughs> but the brickwork, if you can see it, it's starting to pop out. You can see the brickwork down here. It was the brickwork is in that Flemish bond that we mentioned earlier. Very expensive style of, of, of brickwork. The Donaldson building is probably they say the oldest commercial building in the state of Alabama, if not one of the oldest. There may be one down in Mobile that's older, but this is a very old building. This was your typical commercial building. When I say typical, your merchant lived upstairs and his business was downstairs. In the original days, there would have been a balcony with probably two posts out here to cover, make a, to cover a porch. 
and you can walk out on the balcony from upstairs and you'll notice the that second window is re really a door you see where they raised it to be a window the the, the, the stucco you can kind of see how it the, should drop down a little bit lower that was a door to walk out on the balcony um, so this was a basic commercial building that's why we point that out i'll also point out the ghost building if you look on the side see this outline there was a little one room building here and when they stuck they didn't stucco this building until the gosh in the 1990s or so they didn't mean to single out this what used to be a, a little building a little wooden structure but it popped out when they put the stucco on the side of the building and so that's why they call it the ghost building um you can see where it stopped right here in the porch right there um the significance of that little building is there's not a whole lot of significance other than it it made itself known when they put the stucco on here um, it was the utility department at one time. At one time, it was the police station. And in the early, early days, they say when it was the police station, they had electricity in town, but not a lot of it. And so when they wanted the patrolman to come get his orders, maybe he needed to go to somebody's house to check on something, they would turn on the light bulb on the front porch. And if the patrolman saw the light bulb on, he knew he had an order to come into the house. He'd come into the station and get his orders and leave. But anyway, that's just a neat story, but the building uh, is kind of screaming at you, wanting to make sure it's not forgotten. So, all right, let's walk across to the next block.